Hello and welcome to the Outskirts of Faith podcast, the podcast that is literally for everyone. It's a conversation that's been going on for around 2,000 years and that conversation has dawned since the beginning of time. The Outskirts of Faith podcast is brought to you by Monkey Nut Audiobooks. Creating audiobooks, podcasts and voiceovers that keep people listening. So I'm very excited today because I'm joined with a good friend of mine, uh, a chap I've had the pleasure of working with um, and had some wonderful conversations in the past, Dr. Richard Pyle. Richard is a specialist GP in lifestyle medicine. He's also the author of his brilliant book, Fit for Purpose, and also has a podcast running under the same title. What a busy guy. Richard, you are very, very welcome here today. How are you? Uh, thank you, Alec, for that very kind introduction. And I'm well, and it is great to be here. Well, it's not just us as well. We've actually got uh, my dog here. Yeah, which... Denver's your sort of technical assistant, isn't he, as far as I can see? Yeah, pretty much. That's why he's looking away from me mm. with his head down, saying, why is nobody... Sulking slightly. <laughs> he's <Yeah>. sulking. <laughs> if anyone's got a golden retriever, they'd understand this. No, he's, he's now squashed down on the floor. So very, very busy with everything that you're doing. What's happening in, in the world of Richard right now? Well, it's a really interesting time, actually. Um, as you will be aware, if you ever look at the news, uh, a significant bit thing that's going on at the moment is is the real challenges in the NHS. Mm. So my, my NHS GP practice bit of my week is insanely busy, and I, I'm resolved not to spend this whole time moaning about it, but, you know, <laughs> that is something we can go into more detail if you wish. Uh, so that that's challenging, but... You know, I think despite what some of the newspapers' front pages say, I think generally, certainly in our practice, we're doing a pretty good job despite all of that. And then um, outside of that, um, lots of really interesting conversations about um, well-being and lifestyle medicine, um, both in my other NHS job. And, and what's that? Can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, so I am... Uh, the, the word thing's called CCGs, Clinical Commissioning Groups. That may or may not mean something to some people. They all ceased to exist at the beginning of July and they were replaced by a new three-letter initialization, ICS's Integrated Care Systems. This is what the NHS does. It reorganizes itself about, about every five years. <laughs> and is it always three letters? Uh, usually, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it has been in my time. Um, anyway, so basically they're like big CCGs with a few other changes. And, and for our ICS, which covers Hertfordshire and West Sussex, I am the lead for lifestyle medicine, prevention and inequalities, which is obviously a bit of a mouthful bit daunting yeah. but really exciting as well so that's that's keeping me busy um and then um just yeah other interesting conversations some related to the book um just all going on yeah and you you do actually uh talk about some of this in your podcast as well and i've got no problem shouting about your podcast i think it's great that's very kind of you thank you it is even though we, we made it together to essentially to promote the book when it came when out when was that that was like two years ago wasn't i it? think it was a, april 21 something like that oh, was it really um People are still, apparently, according to Buzzsprout, they're still downloading <laughs> it every week. So that's nice. So we're talking about the outskirts of faith. Mm. And we've had some wonderful conversations. I, I remember when we were recording on location your audiobook. And I remember we, we took a break. We went around the field. Yeah, we did, uh, we did laps. Didn't we? we did laps. We yeah. did, And I really valued that conversation. I remember at that point, I was thinking, yeah, this, this is the guy I'd love to speak to more. So I'm really glad we're doing this. Mm. But... With someone who is so dedicated to your faith and for someone who has prayed with me and, and loves to pray, have you ever found yourself on the outskirts of faith? And if you have, what did that look like? Yes, yes, I have very much. Um, I think the first part of my life up until adulthood, marriage and being a parent was actually quite straightforward. I don't have a fantastic exciting conversion story i was raised in a christian family i went to church and you know, well there was no like clouds opening up with light no, shining on your face no i think when i was oh. nine or ten I, I made a conscious decision to to want to to follow the christian faith for myself but it was pretty you know undramatic all in all there was no damascene conversion or anything but um the time that we really had a hard that i had a hard time and we had a hard time as a family was around the time that my oldest son, Luke, he's, he's one of four boys, um, was really having a tough time with his epilepsy. So he was diagnosed with epilepsy when he was six, but it, things got really bad essentially throughout kind of secondary school and adolescence. And that was the time 
where I probably did feel on the edge of it, partly because of just how challenging life was and how unanswered prayer felt, but also because although we did have some some good friends around us, we, we were probably not we were not supported in the in the best possible way by our faith community, by the leadership of our church at the time, and in some ways actually that the things that were said and done in in some ways made it worse. So that was a time where we probably felt pushed away or walking away from what up until that stage had been quite an important part of our lives. So were you trying, were people trying to advise you and, and just what, what was happening there? What, why, why wasn't it working for you? I think, and I know lots of people don't believe this, but there was the, I think there was a view coming from the leadership of the church, which I should stress has changed and is no longer an issue at our church, just to, just to be clear about that, was that if you were having a tough time in life, it was probably because of something that you would that you'd done wrong or you weren't doing right or maybe even more bizarrely that you know ancient relatives of yours had done wrong um i, I know that sounds weird and it is but uh, and and i knew of a number of people within the church who over the years had left because they had struggles in their lives yeah and i think instead of being honest and people going do you know what that really is tough i'm i'm sorry i don't have an easy answer for you what can i do to support you they had been made to feel that there was something wrong with them, something they hadn't, a box they hadn't ticked, say. What would you have liked instead during that time? I think just just more honesty. Um, pe- people who were able to listen and to be confronted with really difficult questions which they didn't have an easy answer for and just to get alongside us. And don't get me wrong, there were individual yeah, people who did that there were people within the church including some of the leadership at the time who were um had a very much more pastoral approach um and friends who were good as well but yeah that, that whereas we, i felt I, I felt it was almost like they were struggling with gosh what do i say to this person who's having a really tough time um uh, it's really difficult to admit that i don't know the answer sometimes bad things happen and it doesn't really seem to make sense based on what has been preached at the church on a Sunday morning. So I'm going to try and find a get out of jail card. Yeah. And here's my card I'm going to play, which gets me out of jail, but actually doesn't really help you. I think it's hard for people. I mean, a question that does pop up, especially people on the outskirts of faith. It's like, how can there be a God? Yeah. How can Jesus exist? How could he have died for our sins? You know, whatever that means. How, how can that be the case if this is happening and this happened, this happens to me and and sometimes i say you know why is this happening to me god and it doesn't get taken away what's your take on that mm. well i should say that as well i'm not pinning this all on, the, on other people so one of the reasons that i struggled and that we struggled as a family particularly my wife and i in terms of our thoughts about god was that we, we felt that prayer was was unanswered and we probably asked ourselves those same questions yeah. you know how does this fit with my image of god when it's three o'clock in the morning and your son's, you know, 10 seizures into what's going to turn out to be a 14 seizure night when most people will call an ambulance after the first one and they aren't stopping and you've administered the emergency medication and you're thinking, blimey, what happens next? Mm. You know, I I had some pretty harsh words to to say to God, you know, some challenges that I threw down and in in the midst of that, it it, it often didn't feel answered. Um, Sometimes it's a bit easier to look at it with hindsight when you've all survived and whether that's days weeks months or even years later but at the time it's really it's really tough i sorry I'm, i think i've deviated i might have deviated from what you asked me no but, no keep going no keep um, going please so i think i had it was my own personal struggle trying to reconcile that with my understanding of god and then these these external factors these people who were perhaps coming up with some pretty weird answers that were that were not very helpful um so that that, that was yeah that was really tough yeah, I think um, it's interesting because you're saying you had some harsh words, you mm. know, to say. Mm. I've had harsh words to say. And that's okay, isn't it, Richard? Like, that's okay to do that. Like, God God listens to that. I, I personally, I know that some people, I know what you mean as well about within the church, like some people may be talking of a certain way, can make you feel a certain something. Mm. But I also believe that within, there are different types of churches, Mm. And they handle things differently. And mm. what may not be right for one person may be right for another one. Glad to hear that it evolved a bit. And I've had other people say similar stories. Mm. But 
then I think that that's when we need to, in many ways, identify the difference between like church and, and community and our relationship with, with God. Yeah. You know, and so and I think it's okay to, and if you're listening to this, you know, if you have a bad day, it's okay to say, God, why? This is really, really tough. Because isn't it lovely to have someone that's always there listening? You know, um, mm. so Richard, tell me where was the where was the the turning point? Because that, thank you for your honesty as well. It sounds like a very difficult time. So where was the turning point? So you you've you've got a bit, say, angry or had a few harsh words mm. or anger may not be the right word, mm. but it was a trying time. What kept you within your Christian faith? Mm. So first of all, I would say anger is a good word. That okay, <laughs> thank you. I also think I think God can take it. You know. Yeah, I think right. he can take sure, me being yes. angry at him. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Um, turning point, again, this is where it's important to be honest. There wasn't a moment where suddenly a light shone down from heaven and God said, it's all going to be okay. And mm. I went, ah, yeah, now I see. Um, I think it was maybe my understanding, which I kind of understood before, but this made me learn it, that actually for me, and obviously this is a personal to me, faith is about not guaranteeing you an easy ride in life because if you tick all the right boxes, everything will be okay because anyone who's lived, well, who's lived could tell you that's not the case and doesn't happen, um, whatever people preach. But it's about, it's the lens through which you you see life and you, and you manage it and you understand it. So I think it was um, me realizing that my faith in God didn't have to depend upon everything being rosy and the fact that things were bad quite often didn't mean that I'd done anything wrong or that God didn't exist and that over time I think sometimes when you're in a really tough situation I think for some people it, it can drive them away from their faith which I totally get and I've got friends and family who've who's you know that's been their response but I think sometimes it can make you think more more deeply about what you believe and in some ways cling, cling more deeply to it as well um I think I had to realize that no one was going to give me the, any answers I wanted. Yeah, yeah. So it was okay to keep on asking the questions. It was okay to try and learn what I could from what was happening. Um, did it, you find that you were praying more during that time? Or did you find yourself stopping that? That's a good question. I I think I probably found myself praying more in the moments of real emergency and, and, sure. and tension and crisis maybe at other times possibly less because i guess on some level but a bit of me was thinking well you know what what have you done for me god you know why mm. should i be spending you know time to put aside yeah. to pray to you but i think also what happened was because i was really exploring well-being and lifestyle medicine as a result of that which i would say is a big positive that's come out of this when you start exploring things like mindfulness and meditation you don't go very far before you get back to the whole spirituality and faith thing because of course that can be you don't need to have a faith to do those things but you then realize if you still got those core beliefs that developing this practice is inevitably going to involve you thinking about your relationship with with god and what you believe so i suppose in developing a meditation practice i then found myself thinking well i don't just want to Imagine I'm sitting on a rock watching leaves float down a stream. Maybe I could look at how that works with faith. Mm. So then I would look at things like the um, the, the lecto, Lectio Divina uh, approach that the Catholic Church has traditionally had, where it's, you know, little passages of scripture sort of repeated over and over again as you think about the meaning, etc. Sorry, I'm probably doing a very bad job of describing what that no, is. No, no, actually, I'm, I'm kind uh, of fascinated here. So keep going. So, so, and then I started listening to a few apps that were specifically did that. Um, so I suppose in, in pursuing one way to help me cope, it kind of ended up partially bringing me back to where I'd come from anyway. That's quite powerful, actually, what you're saying there. Do you find within your experience of talking with people, um, I could easily give some examples here. I'm not, I'm not going to, but with yourself personally, do you find that people often find a closer relationship with God or find a relationship with Jesus when they're in times of, when they're in time, uh, trying times? I'm not sure I can really answer that. Um, 
I think I certainly know that when I talk to, to patients who are having a really tough time, often one of the root causes of that is is or that is either the absence of um, a framework, a philosophy, a spirituality of faith, um, or it can be something that really anchors and helps them. So then that quite answers your question. But but I have chatted to people who've said they've sat in front of me in tears and they've said to me, I don't understand it. I'm married to a lovely partner. I've got, you know, a nice big house. I'm one of the nicest roads in St. Albans. Two beautiful children. Good job. Why am I so miserable? And, you know, sometimes that's because terrible things have happened to them in the past. That's a common theme. But actually, sometimes it's just because they actually have got no meaning and purpose to their lives. So I think it makes people think big questions um, I've seen probably a few people who've rediscovered their faith or have said they're interested in learning a bit more about it. I- I'm not sure I-, I-, I could produce enough data for you to be able to <laughs> <laughs> comprehensively demonstrate that. So if people listen to this right now and they're thinking to themselves, oh, you know, I I feel a bit like that, you know, I, I've, a lot's been going on in my family mm. or had happened in my family or going on with me right now. Do you, would you actually recommend the, a healthy thing to do apart from the lifestyle and all the, the, the wellness that you have this amazing knowledge that's so often, but to the, from their spiritual self, from a faith-led point of view, is it worth exploring that just to, just to see if there is some kind of fulfillment which may help them on a day-to-day basis? I think it's good to be open-minded. Um, I wouldn't even leap straight to that being a faith thing. Mm. One of the things that I talk about a lot to people and I've, I've written about, etc., is the concept of um, ikigai, a uh, Japanese word, which means reason for being. Mm. And, you know, that, that translates into, I suppose, in everyday language, you think about meaning and purpose in life. And, and what I encourage people to do is to think about what their reason for being is. What's their meaning? What's their purpose? What are their values? Because I think, Elliot, that we all have a way of doing life. Some of us know exactly what, to, how we describe that. And we could say, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a religious person, I'm a humanist, I'm an atheist, I'm a whatever. Um, but we all have a way of doing life. And sometimes it is, um, they've never even thought about it, but it's just a habit they've slipped into, which can be unhelpful and a bit chaotic. Sometimes people do have a way of doing life. It doesn't matter that they can't give it a badge. They have a framework that they live and work to which is satisfying and gives them meaning i think sometimes being open to thinking about what really matters to me could lead on to them thinking about yeah maybe maybe faith and what it's all about is one of the things that either matters to me or i'm interested in exploring but i'm not going to sit here today and say you know um you know if you're struggling with life at the moment if you just you know if you want to be friends with jesus everything will be sorted <laughs> out uh, you know it, it will be for some people um you know, no but i think that's that's what i would say i always um have said you know everybody does have these amazing gifts and the amazing things that they have uniquely to them which can bring them happiness mm. and i always say that if you search for those things mm. and fulfill those things and it could just be a case where some people are really good of a paintbrush you know mm. um you know all these different bits and pieces then in many ways you're kind of having a a relationship with God anyway, because you're using the gifts that you've been given and it brings you joy and happiness, which for yeah. me in many ways is, is quite a godly thing to do. But no, I hear your point. Uh, I, absolutely. I agree. And, and I would also say that we probably get a little bit too tied up with exactly labeling something. So it's easy for a Christian to say, you know, Jesus is the son of God. He's the, the way, the truth, and the life. If you can agree on the following four statements and tick a box, then you belong in our club and you will get through the pearly gates when you meet St. Peter. <laughs> I'm just laughing and, my head off and everything will be okay. Um, but the reality <laughs> Isn't is... Isn't that how it works? Uh, well, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? But, but, but the reality is actually that's just a human construct, isn't it? We've all got different faiths. We've all got different philosophies. We, we, even within the Christian faith, we, you know, one denomination emphasizes this, another denomination emphasizes that. Actually, that's just stuff that we've kind of thrown up to try and help us have a sort of sh- an approach to life. But I think it can be unhelpful because it risks people um, not finding God in their own way. Absolutely. And uh, just because they can't say, I'm in this particular yes. club. 
Absolutely. I completely agree. Can you come on every week? I think <laughs> I completely agree with that. And if you're listening to this, do take that on board. You know, do take that on board. Do you be you be do have a relationship in your own way. And that's why there are like there are so many different types of churches. I mean, I remember the first time I looked at Bibles, for example, mm. and I was like, well, there's N K J V. Well, anyone? What does that mean? You know? And all these different translations. And then it soon came to realize that I, I was struggling with all of them, you know. But then when they were being read to me a certain way, like on audiobooks or something, I, I was able to actually take what um, the, the book was saying. Um, there's a new translation by Tom Wright called New Testament for Everyone. And hearing that, I was actually like, yeah, I can relate to this one. This one helps me, you see. And it's the like, same with like churches as well. There's mm. the big singing, dancing you know, rocking guitars. And then there's also places where it's all based around an organ. And, yeah, you know, you've got to find you. And But I think that's just in life in general, right? You know, we're all individual. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've talked about this before, the importance of making it as accessible to everyone as much as possible, using mm. the right language. Right. I think there are lots of parallels between health and, and faith, for example. It's quite easy to use long words in medicine. It's quite easy to to demonstrate just how clever you are and how you're a member of the club because you can you know what these terms mean and you can use them with other people almost like you're speaking a secret language and i think the church can be like that um but ultimately you know what is the church is it's it's really meant to be a way that we show god's love to people isn't it and it's meant to be an important part of the community and and spreading the message about the good news so that should be as uncomplicated as possible and and you know, humans are all different at sources for courses. So you will get some people who love their smells and bells and you'll get other people that love a bit of swinging from the chandeliers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess as long as there's something for everyone, that's the, that's the important yeah, thing. Yeah, and I think for people first giving it a go or wanting to explore further is to ask questions, you know, and to go to these places and, and don't feel uncomfortable, mm. you know, to actually approach someone and say, look, I, this is my first time here. Yeah. You know, um, what's what's going on? <laughs> you know, and, and I can categorically reassure anyone who might walk into our church for the first time that no one's going to be looking at them as they come through the back door thinking, oh, who are these people? No. May, I don't know whether we want them here. <laughs> you, know, we're, we're, you know, generally speaking, vicars are really excited when people turn up who've never been before. So, so you know, 99% of, of ch churches... Because yeah, I always feel like I welcoming. turn up and they're going, oh, he's back again, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're but, still here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if you... And if, you know, you also know. I mean, you know if you go up to someone on the street, you're talking to them, whether you want to kind of see them again. Mm. Um, and if the church isn't... You know, I've, I've said this so many times, Richard, that if one church isn't right for you, you know, try another one because and, they're all different. And I think actually more and more, I have a very strong view that we, we probably still do too many things traditionally, too many things dressed in spiritual jargon, too too much obsessing obsessing over minutia in terms of passages of scripture in the Bible. I think you know a, a modern day church that's fit for purpose should be one that's embedded in the community, does a load of community stuff, interacts with people, is welcoming. You can turn up to it whether you're a signed up member of the club, faith wise or not. And then out of those relationships, there may be other things that grow. But it should be a church that's it should be a place where it serves the community without agenda. Uh, and I think it should be, well, it's a club, I think it's Rob Bell, right, in Velvet Elvis. He said it's a club that should exist for the benefit of non-members. And I think too many, too many churches are still comfortable members clubs. Yeah, I, th I think many are, but I also think many have moved on as well. Hmm. But you're right, you're absolutely right. And it has to evolve. Um, quick question before we move on. Um, if you, if there was someone listening to this right now, going, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'd quite like to move forward maybe explore faith a little bit more in your personal opinion what do you think a good first step is and is it like within a group or is it something internally something by yourself something with a friend what would it be just quickly summarizing what would it be for you it's probably a mix isn't it i think in reality one of the simplest ways is just learning a bit more about what goes on in the, your community because mm. you know people are most likely to engage in a place that they can that they live near, that they can walk to, where they know people, yeah, right. where they might have other communities there already. So I suppose chatting with other people that you know, neighbours, friends, people who work in the shop or whatever, about what's going on. Do they know what's 
what's around here, what's available. And yes, you could always, you know, by all means, sit yourself in a corner and do, you know, an hour of, of deep thinking and drawing and drawing your Ricky guy diagram. <laughs> I don't and, have a time and, for and an plan, hour. <laughs> and, you know, or five minutes a week, whatever, of, of looking at what what matters to you and how you might address that. But I think probably, I think interacting with other humans is probably one of the simplest ways, isn't it? I completely not, agree. Not reading that. a blog, I wouldn't I, have thought. I'd, I'd miss my uh, my little pub group uh, once a month, first mm. Wednesday of every month. I'd miss that. Mm. Okay, so I've asked you, um, as I do everyone um, every week, to bring in a little bit of scripture with them. Yes. And I'd, I'd love for you to tell me what that is, um, where it's from, and why did you particularly choose this bit of scripture? Yes. Yeah, so obviously, thank you for prepping me because putting me on the spot, <laughs> well, I, like might have, I might have struggled. <laughs> uh, so the verse of scripture uh, is, uh, for me, is, there, are, there are many I could choose, but Philippians 4 verse 13, which from memory, I think, according to the NIV version, it goes something like, um, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And the reason that I remember that verse <clears throat> is because my mum gave it to me when I was about to start work as a junior doctor. Okay, I was absolutely terrified. Finished five years of medical school, felt wholly ill-equipped, as has every doctor since the dawn of time, I should imagine, to actually be a real grown-up doctor. One day you're a student, the next day, you know, you, you've got the, the badge on. And the very first day of um, life as a junior doctor this whole cohort of medical students, because most of us came from the same medical school, we all sat in a lecture theatre. We were all given a health and safety briefing about how to wash our hands and use the computer. <laughs> and at, every, at about 3.30, 4 o'clock, everybody else was going home with a massively relieved look on their faces because they weren't on call that night. We used to do a thing called an on-call rotor. So instead of doing shifts, which most doctors do now, you would be up all night uh, for about one every four nights or thereabouts. You'd be up all night, you'd be up all day, and then you'd go home to bed at the end of the day. So I was the first doctor in my group of doctors to be spending that night on call as an emergency junior surgery doctor. And just to clarify, you said all day, all night. Yeah. So you had to be as alert in your yeah. final hour. Regime. Allegedly, yeah. <laughs> um, and everybody else went home and I was there and I had the bleep and I knew it was going to go off and there could be an emergency or whatever. And my mum gave me this verse and I remember that throughout the whole of my junior doctor career, um, I would always think about this verse and if it was three o'clock in the morning and the crash bleep went off, which meant that somewhere in the hospital someone's heart had stopped and a load of doctors were being summoned running in various states of dishevelment to this poor unfortunate individual's bedside and I'd be one of them I would mutter it or gasp it under my breath as I ran from my flat to where the arrest was so uh, and I suppose to be honest life has got uh, uh, thankfully quite a lot less stressful in most ways since those days but actually just that reminder that you're not alone um you're capable of more than you think uh, but you know that that's one of the things that my that my faith gives me do you know I just want to Clarify on that. You're capable of more than you think. Mm. I think that's excellent. In fact, I think we should have T-shirts made up <laughs> with that written on. <clears throat> You're capable of more than you think. And um, I'm going to say that to just everybody out there listening to this right now. You, you can have that for free. That's fine. Yeah, just, just, <laughs> just take that. Take that and know that that is true. You're more capable than what you think. What you think. Incredible. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. That was um, brilliant. So brilliant. I'm not going to stay on it any longer because you've said everything needs to say. And we've now moved to... What, what does, does it mean? mean? I really don't have a clue. So each week, as you know, we uh, attack a, a phrase or a word, something that pops up and people think, what? But they may think to themselves, you know, I'm not going to question it because maybe I should know. Or, or it might be a bit embarrassing to bit have em to ask. Yeah, exactly. Where... Yeah. I mean, I don't care about stuff like that. Do you? If I don't know something, I'll get straight in there. What's that mean? I don't anymore. I used to when I was younger. Yeah. I know. I, I, yeah. I love sounding like I'm a, I'm a bit stupid. I haven't got a clue, you know, because <laughs> yeah. like, often that's how it is. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a word for you this week, and I'd love to know what it means for you. And I'm, I'm really glad we got this word because this word has already popped up mm. in your conversation today. So really great to hear what you've got to say. So the word spirituality what does that word mean to you? Mm. No, th thank you, Elliot. I think this is really a really important word for me because I talk to a lot of people about it in, in my NHS capacity, probably even more than a faith capacity. Okay. Um, I think there are multiple definitions, but I think the main thing for me is that 
Um, it's a word which sometimes we're worried might put people off. Whether we are people of faith having conversations with someone who may not be of faith, or whether I'm trying to explain to someone who's really struggling with their life, with my doctor's hat on, with my lifestyle medicine hat on, about you know one of one of the pillars of well-being. But it's a word that there is potentially so much benefit from from understanding. So I would probably a few definitions. I would say spirituality. You could argue is about what gives you a sense of meaning and purpose in life. Um, what what matters to you? What you think it's all about? Mm. Um, th- there's are you familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? No, I'm not. So this was um, Abraham Maslow. Sorry, was I, feel a, like, I feel like we need an ex- a uh, introduction here. So sit back, everybody. We're <laughs> we're about to get educated. It, it won't take long. Um, so Abraham Maslow, I think that was his first name, uh, was a um, psychologist who lived in the early 20th century, or was born in the early 20th century, and he had a theory about the needs that we have in life and uh, his hierarchy of needs, and, and eventually it was translated pictorially into the into a sort of triangle picture. And at the base of the pyramid, you've got the fundamental needs without which we are lacking. So, for example, warmth, food, physical comfort, you know, sexual intimacy, that kind of thing. And then the further you go up the pyramid towards the tip, these are the sort of uh, the great things that it's really good to have in your life as well, um, but are slightly different from the basics. And one of them is, is um, self-actualization, so becoming all that you can be. And often, and that's right at the tip of the of the pyramid. So that that's really where faith and science and other things can come into play. And it often means uh, working for the benefit of others as well. So I think without spirituality, without understanding what life means to you, you can never get to the top of the pyramid. Mm. Now that's you know that's okay. You get halfway up the pyramid. There are worse things in life, um, but I think that's why it's really important. So I, I say to people, look. We know there's evidence, and there is evidence, for purpose in life and its benefits to your health and well-being. So I'm going to divert, divert just for a moment, if Go I may. It. Go for it. Um, so there, is, there are strong associations, not, not, causa, not causation that's been proved, but strong associations between people scoring highly as having purpose in life, including being spiritual, and enjoying better well-being. So, for example, you're less likely to have a heart attack uh, if you've already got heart disease, if you have a strong sense of purpose in life. You're less likely to have a stroke um, if you have uh, if you have a strong sense of purpose in life. You're more likely to recover from uh, surgery. You're going to recover better from cancer. You may even live longer if you've got a long-term condition like HIV, etc. Um, um, and it could well be as good for you as taking one you know, your five a day or taking a cholesterol-lowering pill. So it's really important to have that, that purpose in life. Um, and so whatever people's understanding of it, is that's why I encourage them to think about it, and that's why it's, I think it's one of the pillars of, of well being. So, along as along with sleep and nutrition and movement and connections and stress and relaxation, it's that spirituality, that purpose and meaning pillar. And if we can encourage people to think about that, it, it's it's good for their well being anyway. Um, and it may then lead on to deeper conversations about faith and meaning. So, th- that's what spirituality means to me but i've kind of left it slightly vague at the same time <laughs> <laughs> well but well, there's different answers as well isn't there i mean i i love what you just said there something which um stood out to me was like the benefits you get from say helping others as well mm. because it does make you feel pretty good doesn't it yeah you know if you yeah. just you know it could be anything it could just be you know car- picking something up that someone dropped and mm. you walk away with that sort of sense of oh yeah yeah you know, it's a whole r- random act of kindness idea, isn't it? Yeah, it's the random act of kindness. Yeah. And but if you do it without trying to do it, you just an instant happens mm. and you act on that and they're kind. Or if someone, you know, comes into work and you say, Oh, how was your weekend? And they go, Oh, it's all right. For you to say, Are you all right? Mm. Rather than, well, I was actually only asking it to sort of pass the time. I've got to get back to my desk. Yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> you actually have that connection. And a lot can happen to the connection, but there is something internal that just makes you feel pretty good and makes you feel like you can conquer the day mm. a little bit more, mm. which maybe does relate to the health side of things, maybe to help you conquer other things that are going on. Mm. Um, but then the the other thing that's standing out for me with the word spirituality is that some people go, yeah, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. No, but I'm spiritual. 
Well, is is there by acknowledging something greater, something spiritual? Mm. Are you effectively just saying the same words? I'm acknowledging God. I'm acknowledging that there is God. Maybe, maybe not like what the God looks like in pictures and things mm. like that. But there is a greater something. There is a spiritual essence that I am connected to. Is that is there similarities there? I think there is some crossover. You know, it, let's let's assume for the sake of argument that, as you and I believe, that there is a God. Mm-hmm. Um, and many, many people look for that in one way or another, um, billions and billions of people across across the world today. So whether or not people formally identify as something, I think there is that drive within within all of us. And then we may end up calling it slightly different things. I think what's interesting about when I did the research for writing the book, looking at the purpose in life thing, what was really interesting was you said spiritual but not religious. I think if I had to choose between being either spiritual but not religious or religious but not spiritual, I'd be spiritual but not religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what what was interesting in um, uh, this big uh, meta-analysis, it was, it was a review that was carried out, I forget the organisation, but it was demonstrated that religiosity didn't actually have any positive effect on your health. So having a meaningful spiritual practice of one sort or another did... But saying I'm wearing the right badge and I go to church seven times a week and I observe this festival and tick these boxes actually didn't make people any happier or healthier. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But I think that um, maybe there's a fusion of the two. Yeah. As you know, perhaps. um, But yeah, I think that's interesting. So I think that starting on the better you could be a case of acknowledging how you feel mm. spiritually within. And I think many people would handle that differently. But I think maybe just listening to the your internal you could be a good starting point. Mm. And then having conversations with, you know, with your friends, with your family, with your religious leaders, whatever people that you trust mm. um, about that. Yeah. Love it. Okay, well, moving on. It's now time for... Splat the Nat. That's right. It's now time for Splat the Nap. Um, as you know, we talk about every week about something that's a little bit annoying, you know, and it could be very annoying, but it could be tiny as well. And it's something that's hovering in front of you. And no matter how much you sway it away or swipe it away, it always flies back a bit like a gnat. And what I'm saying is that we can just splat that nap and we can hand it up to God and just say, look, you know, because God's there to help us, right? And just say, you just take that for me. And I'm not saying deal with it. You know, it's, we've got to deal with our own stuff. But I truly believe that God will work with you and give you the support and the tools that you need to help you deal with that situation. Mm. Mm. So it sort of will clear up your head a bit, help you get on with the day, being the best you can be in that situation. And then you know that you've part that with God to sort of deal with that together. So with what's going on in the world, okay, or just happening around you, and it could be big or it could be small. What would you like to splat and just hand up to God and say, you know, let's fix this? So I have been pondering this. Um, I, my initial thought was, oh, the state of the NHS. But obviously that that's massive. That's a very, very broad <laughs> thing. So I think I, I'd like to keep it NHS, but I'd like to focus it down. So if, if I was to think about the word annoying, what I find annoying is um, the misinformation about what's going on in in GP land, in primary care. Is that to, like, GPs or to the world? The misinformation that's going out to the world. Okay. So the the briefing by certain sectors of the press, I mean, to be honest, all of the press at one time or another, but particularly certain newspapers seem to have it really in for us, and also the the implicit way in which the, the, the government effectively has condoned that by not countering it and also saying slightly unhelpful things about what we do as GPs and, to some extent, NHS England, who've done the same thing. So it's just that feeling um, when you've never worked harder ever in your life and you're seeing colleagues burn out and people are struggling to recruit, the message you're getting is GPs are hiding. GPs are, their surgeries are empty. They're not doing any work. Uh, And I know that I personally cannot change that on a big scale. You know, I, I can demonstrate the way that I treat my patients that it's not true but I can't, you know, get the Daily Mail to stop uh, printing these things. Other newspapers may also be <laughs> applicable. Um, so I suppose <laughs> that, that that's that's 
very, very annoying and can make me quite angry. But actually, that is something that probably if I if I did was if I was able to hand it over and just get on with what I can, you know, I talk to people about the locus of control. I can't control that. But if I were able to hand that over and not think about it and just get on with doing a good job, along with my team who do a good job, then yes, that would uh, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. And it's it's such a shame in many ways. I, I think especially in this country that we've got the news to go on and we literally go on it, mm. you know, full throttle. That's what's happening. And um, I think that the NHS doing an amazing job, you know, and, and you see how hard they're working and how many people, especially like at the moment, you know, with like... Um, strep and things like that mm. you know people are, people get worried they're, they're making more phone calls than ever or is, is the impression i'm getting is that is that true it is it is the perfect storm if you combine flu with covid with strep a i mean the mm. strep a thing is calming down slightly now and if i may be blunt i think it's calming down slightly because the blinking newspapers are no longer putting it on the front page every day which was extremely unhelpful yeah i mean the stats showed that that more people had actually including children had actually died the year before from strep A than this year. But of course, no one was printing stories about it last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you, when you combine all of those things, um, it's very difficult because, you know, even with the best of intentions, these journalists don't always have the absolute truth. Uh, they've all got an angle they're trying to pursue, particularly depending on the political leanings of their particular publication. So it is, yeah, it is tricky and it has been it has been very busy and one of the things that we're thinking about and that i think about is how can i encourage my team you know the well-being of our team together you know we don't all believe the same things in terms of faith some of us do some of us don't but you know we are we, we do all share the belief of that the nhs is a really important thing and that we should be trying to offer it you know as well as we possibly can so it's the challenge for us is um working together as a team to deliver that and thinking about our own well-being as well because if we don't look after ourselves you know jesus said love your neighbor as yourself that does mean you have to love yourself <laughs> uh, and if you don't if you don't do that if we don't care for ourselves as, as nhs workers whether we're in hospital surgery the back of an ambulance cleaning a hospital corridor or whatever um well then we can't do a good job for other people that's wonderful and also um i'm sure there's many people listening to this um as well as myself who just are very very grateful to NHS. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. You know, um, and that's everybody as well. I feel like we should say that. You know, it's, it's you you said about there about the cleaning and everything like that. It's it's a big team, isn't it, that make these things happen? Mm. I'm curious. Before we go to our little uh, three questions, which we do every week, where have you seen God working recently? So. I think this is quite in keeping with the conversation we've had already. I have been critical of, of how some churches have handled things historically. I, I think one example of where I've seen them working actually quite well is in the pandemic, I think the church was one of the organisations that really did step up, actually. I know there were restrictions for a while about who could, how many people could be in the building, etc. Mm. But the amount of work uh, and effort that went into supporting the community, um, you know, the food banks and, and other organisations, um, I think that was a really good example of people thinking practically how they can show love to other people by by doing that, you know, as I said before, with no agenda, just because it's the right thing to do. And we've started doing um, a little event on a Sunday evening in our church, which we don't call a service anymore because we want it to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've done various things, including a quiz. I was one of the quiz masters for that. We've done um, one of our congregation who actually works as a midwife abroad uh, came to share all of the, the, the stories of what she's been doing uh, in Africa. Um, and, you know, 50 or 60 people turned up to hear about that. And they had, you know, cups of tea, cakes, chat, um, building a few connections, etc. We want to do more and more of that. So um, those have been quite nice examples, I think, of, of where I have seen... Um, some of this sort of good work going on yeah that's a lo lovely answer and of course many people actually um say during the covid time actually came to the church as well because suddenly everything went online mm. and people could start you know getting introduced to it that way and the other thing that makes me wonder as well when you talked about cake there 
there is a lot of cake floating around in churches. Indeed. And it, 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 it makes me wonder, you know, how much people would lose if the cake, if a church said, we're not serving cake anymore. Yeah, do you mean how much weight they'd lose? Yeah, both. both. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of those eternal dilemmas I have. I feel like my role as a lifestyle medicine expert with a diploma in the subject, I should be saying at my surgery and my church, let's just have some low-carb snacks, <laughs> yeah. fruit and veg, put those biscuits and cakes away. But, you know, we've got to be real. Um, it's a thing that people really like. Should we uh, use that word, that, that word, ready? Moderation. Moderation. There we go. Everything in moderation, including moderation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, all right, so to close down, um, again, near the end of this podcast, is, as you know, each week we have uh, three questions that we ask people, and you might know them, you might not, some of them might be easy for you, some of them might not. And then if you do have any extra info that you think you could deliver about the answer... Oh. By all <laughs> I'm now feeling more under pressure than at any point down. in this Sit conversation, Elliot. <laughs> I'll say how good Denver's being by it right now. My dog is yeah. literally just lying on the floor. He's a calming sort of, influence. He yeah. is a calming influence, yeah. absolutely. But as you know, after this, he'll be like, take me out. Mm. Okay, so three questions. I asked you the question. You'll hear a little bit of a sound, and okay. then you just wait till that sound, sound finishes while you think about your question as best you can answer. And, and just to be clear, <clears> you, we have not prepped this. I've not been allowed to see these no. questions, have I? This is genuine... Edge of the seat. Stuff. Absolutely. Okay. And right. I, but naturally, I know the answers to all these questions. Well, of course. And I didn't 10 minutes before you arrived today Google them, Google them, yeah. and do any research. Because no, you're a professional and you wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. No, I good. wouldn't do that. Okay. And I'm only holding the iPad because I like holding it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Understood. But that's, that's the cool thing about this, though, as well, is because I get the learning as well. Yeah. That's the great <laughs> thing about it, you know? Okay, cool. All right. Question number one. Before Jesus started preaching, what was his job? He was a carpenter. Now you have to wait till for uh, oh. until it finishes, so it's more dynamic. Okay, okay. Okay, wait for it. It's finished now. I think he was a carpenter. He was. He was a carpenter, but here we go. How do you know that? It's an excellent question. I'm, I'm probably assuming that because his dad was a car, his spiritual, uh, sorry, earthly father was was a carpenter. So I guess he would have taken on the family trade. Yeah, yeah. So I I had to look this one up because I, I got the I saw the question. And I thought, okay, I know the answer to that, but then you've got to kind of back it up. I think sometimes you've got to ask yourself like the next question to an answer that you yeah. come up with. And I was like, oh, I've not got a clue. So I looked it up, and in Google there was lots of conversation about it. There wasn't necessarily right. a passage where he quoted, for example, how much it would cost you for him to do a bit of joinery in your kitchen. Exactly. You know, he, um, <laughs> have, you seen, have you seen that? Pro- put my glasses on so I can read this. Have you seen the programme um, or any of the episodes of The Chosen? No. No, have you heard of it? No. Oh, right. It's, it's quite a big deal. It's a big, um, f- uh, funded by the people uh, film thing, which you can watch on loads of episodes. You can watch it on YouTube and right. things like that. It's very, very good. A lot of people say it's probably or they'd like to think it's the closest to how it actually would have been okay. back then. But there's a bit in there where... <laughs> so I'm laughing. Because I, for me, I just think it's a really ridiculous bit. And I have to say, I support it. I, I think it's a great programme. I watch it and I love it. But um, they do sort of like a sort of flashback thing when Jesus is younger and he's building and, you know, his mum's there, Mary's there. And, um, and basically, she, he builds a table. Right. And she tries to sit on the floor and she goes, it's too high. And he says, he goes, oh, no, I, I haven't built chairs yet. You know, basically, like they haven't been invented. <laughs> and I was just thinking, <laughs> that, bit, that for me was a bit far-fetched, bit you know. Okay, so, it, but it does say here, um, it says Galatee, I'm sorry if the pronunciation is wrong, pastor of Long Hollow Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, says the main support for the tradition position are Mark... Uh, chapter um, 6, verse 3, and Matthew, chapter 13, verse 55. In those verses, Jesus and Joseph are called, apologies again, tecton, or tecton, which is most frequently rendered carpenter by Bible translators. Okay. So I, that was, that was I, didn't, I don't even as long as I, As long as I'm right, I'm, don't, mind, <laughs> don't mind where your sources come from. All right, you get it's your fine. point. You yeah, get I have the point. point. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I, you know, you're making me, you, I feel like I need more credit for doing a bit of research there. <laughs> you know, I didn't put a lot of work into that. Question number two. Name Jesus's hometown. 
So just think about this because you could get this one wrong. So name Jesus's hometown. I'm going to say Nazareth. Nazareth. Uh, let me give you this. Oh, correct. Let me know. Kids. There you go. Because uh, some people, and if you go on like some sites and things like that, they will actually say Bethlehem. But they went. His his parents went to Bethlehem for yeah, him to be born. Exactly. Although so. born in Bethlehem, according to Matthew and Luke, mm. Jesus was a Galilean from Nazareth. Yeah, hence, oh, little town of Bethlehem. Exactly. I mean, that will be. I can see why people would make that mistake, but it, it's that would be a schoolboy error. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's kind of like when you say to me, you know, where you know where are you from, and I'll say blah blah blah. Where were you born? I say Rochford. Completely different. Yeah. Okay. Right. Moving on. Um, I just want to point out that I'm not relating my birth with the same as Jesus. Just put, I didn't, just put think out that, didn't think that for a minute. Okay. All right, here's a uh, true or false for you. All right, true or false, Jesus asked the children to stay back while he was teaching important things to grown-ups. So true or false, Jesus asked the children to stay back while he was teaching important things to grown-ups. True or false? I'm going to say... False, because I think Jesus said, uh, let the little children come unto me, for to them belongs the kingdom of God. That's three out of three. And my live, my live studio audience. Live studio audience, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there he does. It says, uh, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Jesus said, let the children, little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Richard, as always, your conversation could go on for a, a good few hours. I feel like there could be people listening to this that will want to kind of explore what you're saying um, a bit further. Is there a resource or somewhere they can go which could offer support to the things you've been discussing today? Uh, well, if I were to shamelessly plug some of my own resources... No, no, go for it. Um, I've got a website called Wellbeing for Real Life, which actually is also the name of the podcast that we did together after the book came out. Mm. And on, on that website, there's lots of further information, including the book, Fit for Purpose, um, links to YouTube videos where we look at different topics um, as they affect us. Um, and there's a bit of a blog, which I must admit I need to update. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, you can find everything there. And I'm on um, Twitter and, um, well, mainly Twitter, actually. I don't tend to do Instagram and Facebook and Snap, Snapchat and TikTok or anything stuff. like that, yeah. <laughs> well, Richard, what we're actually going to do is include uh, your website and your book on our resources page on the website um, on outskirtsoffaith.com uh, because it's a place where people can go to and no matter who you are, hopefully there will be something which somewhere they can go to say, that's not for me, that's not for me, but that is for me. Like, like we established today, everybody is different, you know, and you've got to do what's right for you and go what's where what's right for you so um they'll, you'll definitely be able to help people with your book your brilliant book and your podcast and your resources so uh, i'll put that on there and um go on the website and you'll be able to check that out and um just a, my sincere thanks for today it was just lovely talking to you i was hoping that uh to close down you might like to close us down in prayer and then i'll join in at the end and then sign off yeah th thank you Elliot. and it's been lovely to catch up with you again um and i'll certainly do my best um Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for, for great conversation. Um, thank you for the needs that we all have within us to, to connect. Um, I hope that what we've spoken about today, Lord, will be you know, a value and a blessing to, to people listening to this mm. and that it will be the beginning of them or a continuation for them of them carrying on uh, with their spiritual journey, Lord, whatever that may be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. And Lord, just to be with Richard and his family and all the work that he's doing with other people in the NHS and all the people who are making a difference, I just ask you to bless everybody surrounding the NHS and people surrounding them. So there's like a, a ripple effect of just your blessing going out and helping people make good choices and wise choices and being the best they can. And Lord, I ask you to be with our listeners today and their families and their friends and loved ones that they may choose to have a, a healthier life whether that be in their intake or spiritually but ultimately just for them to make good choices and to feel good and to live a life closer to you and a journey taking journeys which will lead themselves ultimately ultimately closer to you 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. It has been uh, a pleasure having you here as always. And be sure to follow us on all our social media sites. And just remember, hashtag oof. Always include that when you're uh, sharing it with your friends and your social and come on to our uh, website anytime, outskirtsoffaith.com. I'll see you again real soon. Thanks so much. You've been listening to the Outskirts of Faith podcast. We would love more people to join our community, so please subscribe, share this podcast, and join us on our social media. And of course, you can visit our resource website at outskirtsoffaith.com. This podcast was edited by Chris Byland, the YouTube video editing by Adam Moss, music by Matthew Salvage, and hosted by Elliot Frisbee. Let's go!